Howdy folks, this is the story of the time I thought I had found the fastest spinning millisecond pulsar. Now, instead of just kind of doing this like a podcast, because that would be a little bit boring, I thought it was a good idea to tell this story while taking you guys along on a little mountain bike uh, excursion I had through the Rocky Mountains. Bear in mind, this trail is one that I regularly go on, and actually this route is one I regularly take. And also, with the story, I need to be a little bit sparse with the level of information I give out, as there are other individuals involved with this, as it involves both myself and the entire research team I was a part of. Uh, And because I don't necessarily want to publicly kind of display their names with this. I'm going to have to be somewhat sparse with the level of information I give out. But that being said, this is the story of the time I thought I had found the fastest spinning millisecond pulsar. All right, folks. First stop of this little trip. Pardon my wariness, but there was warnings at the beginning of the trailhead that there is a calf moose and a mother moose grazing in this area. But this all sort of starts with me doing research work, or starting to do research work as a student. I've mentioned before that I wanted to do neutron star theory, but what I actually ended up doing was neutron star observing work. And that was because my advisor, who had done theory for many years, she's been doing neutron star theory and studying neutron star theory since well before even the first observations of neutron stars by Jocelyn Bell and as was suggested with the uh, suggestion of uh, Scorpius X1 being a a neutron star source. With her team, one of the research scientists who is an ex-student of hers, got his PhD with her, uh, had seen a lot of success doing work with AGN, active galactic nuclei, and uh, observing work primarily with XMM Newton, Suzaku, and New Star. So she had suggested that I work with him a little bit on a a project that she was interested in by exploiting a particular uh, method used a lot in AGN work and to use it on accreting neutron star sources. That method is called ionized relativistic reflection. And the thing that we wanted to use it for was to estimate a measurement of the inner radius of the accretion disk around a neutron star, an accreting neutron star source. Now, obviously, this is a really important uh, parameter because what you'll learn in neutron star research is that everything, no matter what it is, theory, observing, even if we're observing different parameters for different purposes, this is all really moving towards the goal of uh, understanding or getting really good measurements of mass and radius because that will help us constrain neutron star equation of state and that will give us a better understanding of the nature of ultra-dense matter. I just thought I heard something... Now, a good majority of this work that I that I was doing uh, was mostly observing work, and it was just going through and finding the actual neutron star sources. You know, as a student doing doing research in a, a research group, you're really going to just be tasked with a lot of the grunt work stuff, and that's what I was really tasked with by trying to find one of the sources that we wanted to try to use this methodology on. And so we needed to do a lot of spectrum analysis, and so I got really good at doing spectrum analysis. Now, there are numerous sources that uh, we could have chosen from, and I read papers and papers and even more papers, and this is maybe, uh, let's say like a six to nine month period here that I was just reading through a bunch of different papers, exploring other accreting neutron star sources, and trying to figure out just what we know already from them. And I was mainly looking for sources that we knew had uh, a broad iron line, or at least that we could maybe be able to get a broad iron line from, because that was very important uh, for this particular methodology. Now, the particular source uh, that we ended up settling on after a lot of deliberation was actually a source that I'm going to call XB. And the reason why, again, is because of what I prefaced at the beginning. A lot of this grunt work of just figuring out what source we want to try to apply this methodology to really fell on me. The entire research team was my advisor, uh, two research scientists, myself, and one other student who ended up kind of not really doing that much because he had worked on another project with my advisor and basically had 
he was finishing up his degree, there's really no reason for him to continue doing much research. So it was really just kind of falling onto me to read through all the different papers that were there, go through and do the spectrum analysis to see uh, if I could reproduce certain broad iron lines and, you know, kind of evaluate which source would be the most promising for us to actually go and apply this methodology to and really rigorously do some spectrum analysis on it. Now, the other uh, research scientist on the team was, uh, again, very well versed with uh, Chandra and doing a lot of other combining theory and observation and stuff like that. But uh, again, hadn't really done anything with this methodology and with it being much more of an AGN type thing, he was kind of stuck in more of an advisory role. My advisor also obviously is in an advisory role by default, just by definition. But uh, she also, she doesn't write code. That was something that, that, that I was meant to do. She doesn't mess with any observing, you know, XPEC, data reduction, anything like that. She just, she's very knowledgeable from the theoretical side of things. And so she understands the theory of what's going on and is very much so just kind of helping with regard to that. So when we would get a result or something worth showing her, she would say, yes, that makes sense based on the theory, or no, it doesn't make sense based on the theory, based on a, a value that we would estimate or measure or fit or, or something like that. Now, at a certain point, we had made the uh, decision that we needed timing, un we needed understanding of timing. And this came from the other research scientist who had worked with some individuals who had done a lot of timing work on pulsars before. And he proposed, uh, he, he gave me a bunch of references and proposed we use the same methodology used in these papers uh, to measure, to try to measure the spin frequency of the particular uh, pulsar in the uh, XB source, or just, you know, measure, see if we can measure the spin on the XB source. And so I went through, found a whole bunch of papers on the XB source with regard to timing and found out that actually, uh, you know, there was a really well established measurement, or at least I thought at the time, but when we tried uh, to use that spin frequency to try and bat down some of our error bars and to try and do some other kinds of analysis, we ended up getting a lot worse of a result. And so we went back to the drawing board on trying to measure the spin from the massive amount of RXTE data. So anyways, we decided to go through and try and either reproduce the result and see if there's something wrong on our end or if we could maybe see if there's something wrong with the result. Now, obviously, given the way that the story is going, you can and the title of this, you could probably imagine that we ended up finding out that actually we think the result is wrong because I went through all of the RXTE data. I was able to reproduce everything that the two individuals on this particular paper from 1999 were able to, to get. And the statistical evidence from our perspective just wasn't there. It wasn't, it wasn't a strong enough result for us to say these are coherent oscillations from a pulsar. So after all that, we had basically decided that we still need, you know, some understanding of the timing of this particular source, and we should look for potential other uh, candidate spin frequencies of the assumed pulsar in this source. And so I was then tasked with going through and searching through all the data to try and find out uh, if there was a, a good candidate uh, spin frequency in the data. And going through all the same RXTE uh, observations, we didn't really find anything. And so we had to focus on uh, looking at other data sets. And that's kind of where Newstar comes in not just from a spectrum modeling perspective, but also with doing some timing work. Yes, folks, we made it. Welcome. Isn't this awesome? I like to come out here and just suck in all the natural splendor whenever I need to really clear my head. Look at that. Beautiful. All right, so after analyzing everything, we kind of decided to take a look at just the new star data. We were basically just looking for something else that had adequate resolute timing resolution so we could try to measure that spin frequency. You know, we'd gone through all the RXTE, couldn't find anything, and we needed a new source. And so we we're just looking for which detectors give us the most appropriate 
uh, timing resolution. And New Star is two microseconds at temporal resolution. Now at the time, we were completely unaware of the known dead time issues, which is what came back to bite us and how I kind of clickbaited um, Archive and thought I found the fastest millisecond pulsar. We had looked through all the documentation, we had looked through all these different papers on neutron star timing, and I, I, I promise you, we, we, we definitely went through and spent we, many, many weeks, in fact, probably almost close to two months, just crossing all our T's, dotting all our I's, and, and we just missed uh, the no time for dead time paper. So we thought that we had uh, discovered the fastest millisecond pulse, so we used the same methodology found first the signal at 1780 hertz and we're like all right well that that that's way too high that has to be a harmonic we looked uh, more closely for uh, 890 hertz and we found it at a much stronger magnitude we found it on both observations there's two uh, ob there's only two observations of the xb source and we found coherent you know results uh, albeit not a consistent Gaussian shape, but a very, very pronounced result for the FPMA and FPMB detectors in both observations. And we thought, okay, well, this is it. We thought, you know, this result completely blows out all the other results. But yeah, we went ahead. And since I was the one who ended up writing all the code, doing all the data reduction and everything else, my advisor, you know, basically said, you know, Nick, you are going to be the first author on this letter. It was a letter to uh, app J that we ended up putting on Astro PH first because uh, everyone's all concerned about scooping, or at least in my group, everyone was all concerned about scooping, especially on a paper like that, discovery paper. So I was first author. I ended up writing most of the paper. Uh, second author on the paper was the other research scientist who proposed we go after the spin and and was much more the the guiding. Uh, source kind of in that again you know I was the only one doing the data reduction and writing the code we went ahead and uh, you know went through and published and when I say published I mean pu put it up on archive submitted for submitted it for publication it almost certainly would not have met or, or passed uh, the referee review which it didn't even get to because as soon as uh, it posted up on archive. I mean, I, I remember the night very vis vividly. I was very excited. I, I stayed up to make sure that it, 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 it got up on archive and I got the email. I saw it was there. I was so excited, so happy about it um, up on Astro PH. I mean, I was more happy than that than if it would actually be accepted, I think. And within about an hour, I had like three, four emails, but I was like, you know what? I'm not going to look at these, which was probably a good choice. Um, because there were many emails when I woke up, uh, over 80. And in the course of the entire time that the paper was up on Astro PH, uh, on archive, or at least for download, it's still, it's, you know, there's still a reference there when you withdraw something, which by the way, uh, you know, I withdrew the paper, obviously. It, there's still a record of it there. The title is still there. Uh, the abstract is still there. But yeah, I had over 80 emails. Many of them were from GR folks who were trying to write like LaTeX code in the email, which I was like, I don't like, I'm, I'm not going to copy and paste this and compile it. I don't care. Uh, you know, there were people saying like, oh, what a fantastic result. There were people from obviously the... Uh, uh, dense matter side of things who had emailed me asking for more information, things like that. So yeah, many, many emails from all different people. Uh, some of them very nice, some of them not so nice. You know, they're, they're from all different walks of life. I'm not saying that this is all just, all 80 people saying, um, you know, you messed up this thing with New Star. In fact, there is really only like four or five that I could think about, and only one of those uh, individuals was actually uh, rude about the whole thing. The other four were actually quite nice. One of them was actually the the first author of that no time for dead time paper and was like, hey, I wrote this entire paper uh, about New Star and using it with conventional FOIA methods and 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 for timing analysis uh, or, or you know getting getting timing results. And uh, this is absolutely what you have. There are a few other individuals. One of which was an individual who. Uh, worked very closely with the original authors of the XB paper that came out in 1999, discussing the, uh, you know, saying that they found the, the the spin. And to be completely honest, there's a whole aspect to that with uh, plotting the contours over the power spectrum that I'm admittedly not understanding that well. But just from the statistical side of things, I, I still don't agree with the result. 
I, I don't think three sigma is is good enough um, uh, statistical confidence uh, to to declare that a detection. So I think that's probably why they're saying nearly coherent detections instead of coherent detections. Again, it, th those individuals who wrote that paper uh, are absolute legends when it comes to neutron star uh, observing, neutron star timing. Um, and as the same person, you know, the, the, I don't, uh, the other individual who worked very closely with them, I think as a student actually, it was the one who reached out and said like, hey, we, we, we verified this result. And it, to a certain extent, I kind of verified the result also because I was able to reproduce their entire table minus doing any of the contour stuff. So, I mean, clearly something was right. But anyways, got to, you know, the main, those are the two main emails that really made me be like, okay, something's up, you know, something's going on here. The particular author from that uh, No Time for Dead Time paper, or just the Dead Time paper, it basically said, you said, you know, you tested your methodology out on the Crab Pulsar and many other pulsars. Go exactly to that spin frequency and you will find it. There are more than enough counts, especially from the Crab Pulsar, where that signal will be there, um, or where that result will be there with a great amount of strength. And I ran a quick test, a very crude test, not very high resolution, saw the you know the result that was expected to be there and i was just like all right we've detected the dead time essentially and we don't have a result and without even consulting my advisor or the other research scientists i withdrew the submission to apj letters i withdrew or submitted a withdrawal uh, request from astro ph and kind of freaked out because it wasn't immediate but then i i got the email i was like oh it's not immediate ended up withdrawing it and then had to get on the phone with all the two research scientists as well as my advisor and my advisor was furious she's like oh you don't understand the astrophysics community especially the gr people where most of them gr people gr people are assholes which i mean yeah but she's like oh you know you know you're going to face scrutiny. You shouldn't have pulled it. You know, whatever the results good, the results, right. The statistics are, are there. And she wasn't really understanding it. And it took like a week until, uh, the other research scientists were like, no, no, he was right in doing what he did. Um, and pulling it off of Astro pH. It really sucked because, because I, I had to answer all those emails and there are a couple of emails. Actually, I ended up getting a, a little under 200 in total, just in the total amount of time that it was up on Astro pH. There were two of them in particular that I really needed to make sure I answered very timely because one of them, one of them was actually from the news and uh, they wanted to, they were like, Oh, you know, could you know, you comment more on this. And I, as soon as like the, this, this was like, as I was figuring everything out and answering all the other emails, I was just like, I, I, I just had to, as soon as I saw it, I had to quickly email back and be like, do not write anything. Like the result is wrong. <laughs> the last thing I need is you saying like, Oh, you know, Nick went ahead and uh, found fastest pulsar. No, I didn't. No, I didn't. <laughs> no, I didn't. There was a good 48 hour period where I was just on pins and needles. And it really sucked because, uh, you know, I'd worked for, you know, over a year um, just on this source and it felt like it was all wasted. That that was really what sparked the independent work that I do right now. My advisor, you know, at well after the fact, gave me a different project to work on. Um, and I was just kind of like half-assing that project. I really didn't care about it. Um, it was on another accreting low mass X-ray binary source, but that's when I started just being like, all right, you know what? I'm going to start doing a lot more timing work on my own. And that's what I'm doing right now. And, uh, you'll get to see a lot of that timing work here very soon, uh, because I want to talk about it and I want to share it. But this kind of video, this kind of whole thing is what I really want you know i really wanted to put out first before doing any of that because from this entire thing it taught me a lot and with or with one primary research scientist who drove me to do a lot of the timing stuff with him um or, or initially uh had basically been like all right we've you know we got it we got egg on our face we made a mistake but you know i think you learned something very valuable here and that's integrity and I, I absolutely agree. Integrity and honesty is one of the most important things in science. A null result is still, in fact, a result. You know, the, the further proof to the dead time issue with New Star. Okay, that, that's that's what I did. And in fact, I went back to the crab. And I went back to many other sources and timed them. And 
just to convince myself that the methodology I was using was correct. Because in, in those emails, you know, the author from the Dead Time paper, uh, other individual who worked very closely with the original authors were like, you know, it looks like you're using, you're preparing the data correctly. It looks like you're using the methodology correctly. Um, and you didn't know about this Dead Time issue with Newstar, which I didn't. I'm really glad it happened. It taught me a lot. And it made me start on a project that I'm very passionate about and that I really like. And inevitably, I ended up using uh, a piece of that project, mainly on the Crab Pulsar, um, to get my degree. And uh, that's probably the first video that you will end up seeing about my research work. Without honesty in science, there really is, uh, you know, science can't function in the way that it is. You need to follow a scientific method. You need to be honest. And, you know, again, even if you get a null result, it's still very valid. Uh, a lot of what happened with this project drove me to do my own work uh, on, uh, you know, and start my own independent project, primarily on studying uh, neutron stars and pulsars via uh, timing. None of that probably would have happened if it wasn't for this null result. Anyways, that is the story of the time that I thought I found the fastest spinning millisecond pulsar everything worked out really well in the end and it's kind of funny you know the the whole idea of it still being up on an archive and astro ph because it, it kind of is really clickbaity it's, it's along the lines of hey we found the fastest you know spinning pulsar and then you know just because i wasn't really sure what to do with the abstract and, and the abstract still being there i just kind of put in the abstract like no we didn't this should just be further evidence of why uh, you know, you shouldn't use conventional FOIA methods uh, with new star data because of this dead time issue. And yeah, so there, there's some really good use cases to come out of this. But ultimately, at the end of the day, I'm really happy that it happened. And, uh, you know, I'm really happy to share all that information with you because now I can kind of build uh, a good baseline uh, to start to share some of the uh, research work that I want to share 